Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people to- driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Evgeny, who is the co-founder and CEO of Zerion, which is a well-known Web3 wallet. Evgeny, welcome. Thanks, Friederike. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's uh, the podcast that I've been known for, I've known for a while, so I'm I'm super happy to be here. Uh, and yeah, thanks for hosting. <laughs> cool. So you know about us, but what about you? Tell us about yourself. What's your background? Sure. Uh, so as mentioned already, I'm I'm Evgeny. Um, I've been in the crypto space uh, since roughly forever. Um, I would say like <laughs> since the. Yeah, like the, the, my first interaction was like very like early on in 2015 or even uh, earlier than that. But I really, really got into crypto after the um, uh, the white paper for Ethereum, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, I still remember the day when I was uh, I was on the subway, uh, just like scrolling through the Internet. And I was I came across the, the white paper and I just read it through it. Uh, it blew my mind. So. Uh, that's how I got into like the whole space. Basically, uh, since then, I've been I've been committed to working in Web three, even though it wasn't called Web three back in the day. Um, and um, yeah, before that, I, I was still studying at, at that moment. Um, I was studying computer science. That's my background. Um, engineer by education and like my first adventures. But honestly, in like in my spirit, I'm a, I'm an, an entrepreneur. So I've been working on my own projects uh, basically since high school. Uh, and I started uh, like various uh, mobile apps, chatbots, uh, and some of them like with variable level of success. I think the, the most interesting one was actually already in the crypto space. That's before Zerian was uh, an app called Crypto Trader. It had over a million downloads with like pre like zero mar- marketing efforts or anything. Uh, it was just for tracking whatever price was, and I built it for myself, and uh, it just scaled uh, to to many people liked it. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, I worked. This is how I actually found my co-founder. I was uh, uh, building mobile applications uh, with like a venture studio in Moscow. So that's uh, that's the background. Cool. When you were on the subway reading the Ethereum white paper. What was it exactly that appealed? Kind of the technology, the technology itself, or kind of the the idea of what it could empower in the long run? Um, yeah, so this is, I think, a fairly typical story for anyone living in um, a third a third world a world country. Um, so uh, when the financial system, basically, like after the Soviet Union collapse, obviously Russia took a capitalist uh, approach, but um, the financial system was not nearly as stable as it was in uh, Europe, for example, or in the US. Uh, and uh, first, m- I was intrigued by the the idea of programmable money. Uh, this is like first when I read about Bitcoin. But as a as an engineer myself, I was not convinced fully. I would say uh, that this is going to be. Um, you know, I, I kind of liked it. Uh, I started reading about the nature of currency, the nature of money, how it all works. Why is uh, the currency in my country collapsing, uh, and uh, in others it doesn't? Uh, why the stock market behaves? Why, but like the way it behaves. Um, so this got my interest, but really, really got excited when I understood that you could leverage uh, the technology of blockchain to exp- extend that to essentially programmable trust. So it's not just about money anymore. Uh, and if we can't have this uh, shared trust layer, which is the Ethereum computer, uh, this is where I, I got, I, I was sold basically. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, I think there were a lot of other uh, really look forward looking ideas in, in the white paper, uh, many of which were, I guess, took years and years to realize. But uh, I think the main proposition uh, was, yeah, changing, like changing the rules basically and where this whole uh, thing is headed. Yeah, absolutely. So after the success of Crypto Trader, you guys started Zerion together. What was the no- motivation behind? I mean, basically, even back then, there were um, a multitude of wallets, right? So, kind of, what was the motivation behind starting yet another wallet? Yeah. Um, so I think it, it's fair to kind of took a little bit of a deroute here and uh, talk about Zerion's evolution. So Zerion was 
uh, zero in the, is a wallet only for the last year and a half, roughly. Uh, and all the all the time before that, Zerian was uh, kind of th three different companies. Uh, so we really started with um, even like you, you can call it the Spark Contract Development Studio. Uh, so we were helping other companies and uh, with ideas who knew what they want to build on top of Ethereum, just realize their uh, things. Um, and later, I think like the first really the story where of Zerian itself starts with uh, portfolio tracking when we decided that we actually didn't want to build a wallet. There were so many already, like there were quite a few wallets. Uh, the space was uh, pretty much starting to, to be filled with a, a magnitude of tokens and uh, people really needed tools uh, for them to, to keep track of stuff that is happening, what they have even in their wallet. Uh, and uh, this is, by the way, still a big issue for the for the existing big wallets. Uh, we don't have to call, the, call them out here. Um, and uh, we started with that mission to track basically everything that happens on chain such that the users don't have to worry about it and they have control because control means safety and uh, this is how we got our first user base. So people were coming to Zerian just to see what they really have in their portfolio, what kind of transactions they were making. Uh, and um, that's been uh, fairly successful uh, and this is how we got started. But um, what we realized over time um, is that DeFi is becoming like a big thing and it's now much easier uh, than ever because of this uh, access to decentralized trust in a way. We could just integrate Uniswap without even like going and talking to Uniswap uh, and people could start leveraging that within our interface. And we uh, soon noticed that uh, basically the users who are transacting using Zerian they are our, you can, you can call it like super fat. So they just love the experience. They love the UI. They like, love the combination of the portfolio tracking with the transacting bar, part. Uh, and, uh, we kind of, we dived into this path and we've started, uh, doing more and more integrations. We were the first ever integration of Uniswap. I think the first integration of MakerDAO, the first integration of Compound V2 and like a few other protocols. So really, really early in the DeFi journey, um, and eventually this this whole, uh, I guess, pathway led us to realizing that this is time when we are ready to start our own wallet uh, because the existing wallets were still lagging behind in terms of the, I, I guess, the data capabilities So the, and the UX in general. So UX, I think, in, in crypto in a big way is uh, built on top of good data and like fast um yeah, like fast understanding what was in your wallet to make good decisions, to sign transactions in a safer way, to exactly know like and how uh, connecting to dApps and et cetera, et cetera. So all of that requires good information. And we had that for, for a while now. Uh, and uh, we decided that the wallet should have all, uh, should have it all. Uh, and um, yeah, that's uh, that was the whole uh, motivation behind, behind moving into the wallet space eventually. I think it, I kind of see it as like the, the end game for Zerian. We we were thinking of uh, doing a wallet for a very very long time. We always like postpone that, and like it's much harder to compete. It's harder to monetize, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but yeah, I feel like that we are ready now. And yeah, lastly, I think what's important to mention here: uh, a very long time ago, I think it was like 2017, we even had um, an attempt at wallet. We didn't put too much um, effort into it, but it was called Tokenary. It was one of the um, it was built by one of our engineers, so basically like a uh, kind of like a sister company or a spin-off from Zerian, uh, and uh, it was called Tokenary. So that was like very very simple wallet. Uh, it's it was built using the kind of te Telegram principle of removing all the clutter, and just keeping uh, focus on uh, one single wallet, just the tokens and signing transactions. That that's it. Uh, it was it was a cool thing. Uh, we still had uh, we still have users on that. Uh, but we're not really doing anything anymore with this. And obviously now Zero is is the main thing. Okay, maybe let's talk about um kind of how Zerion handles for the user. And then we can kind of talk about kind of the spectrum of wallets and kind of what they do for UX and kind of what you guys plan to do for UX. Because obviously it's I mean it's super apparent that user experience for wallets has to greatly improve for this to kind of see any mainstream adoption so kind of talk us through um if i go to zerion.io now um and want to create a wallet how do you guys do that for me where are the keys um how do i safe keep them yeah um so 
I think the best experience would be on mobile still. So we are in the process of releasing. So for our web users, we are in the process of releasing the extension. So this is uh, happening already. We're going to go public live um, in about a month from now. Uh, so we're pretty much gearing for that and excited for, for this launch. We still we already have uh, over 10,000 beta users of the extension. Uh, but yeah, that, that would be the milestone. Um, majority of our users on, of the wallet are on uh, mobile. Uh, and um, the way it works is a very classic uh, non-custodial wallet. Uh, so you come, you create a seed phrase, we we'll guide you through how you should uh, recover that. We were obviously thinking about other ways of custody. Uh, but I think for us, the main reason why we wanted to keep it very simple uh, is that first, we do rely a lot on composability, so dApps uh, have to work uh, for for the wallet to be useful. Uh, and second, we wanted to, it's, you can go like a vampire attack on MetaMask. Uh, we wanted users to migrate over, and we still have a pretty big chunk of users just moving their seed phrase from MetaMask uh, to Zerian. Uh, and yeah, the, the seed phrase just stays on, on the device, uh, and uh, we obviously don't have access to it. You can back it up in iCloud if you want. Uh, and yeah, that's about it in terms of just creating a wallet. So it's very simple, it's just a few taps. Yeah, and um, in terms of the experience, I guess uh, what you get is uh, the DApp browser that works. So you can connect to any DApp and you can tr side transaction, uh, transactions. You can um, connect to pretty much any network out there. So we support, um, fully support in terms of data capabilities. We support about 10 chains and the rest, you can just add any custom RPC and start signing transactions. We do check every transaction before it's sent uh, by simulating it and giving you what what is going to happen to as a result of this transaction. I know that the safe does that too, uh, and like good, better wallets are, are doing that now, so that's good. Uh, and uh, we obviously check the domain names for phishing uh, and basically doing all, all kinds of security checks in the moment of transactions. And we plan to add more and more stuff on um, the security of the of basically interacting with the blockchains. Okay, um, we'll dive into that in just a bit. Let's kind of just remain on the seed phrase for now. So I assume the seed phrase is in some sort of secure enclave um, in, in your yeah. phone, right? When you say you you, um, you can back it up to iCloud, can you also just uh, write it down kind of pen and paper or do you never get to see it? Uh, you, you obviously can, yes. Uh, okay. So that would be the, the default way for, for most people who know how to handle the, the seed phrases. Uh, but uh, backing it up uh, to iCloud is still like uh, it's kind of an easy way for you to for someone who is not uh, too experienced with crypto but still want to uh, give it a go uh, to not lose the key um, if, for example, their device is uh, stolen or lost. Uh, in that case, uh, it, they might have forgotten to uh, back it up using like a paper uh, and a pen. And in that case, they could just uh, using their Apple ID uh, or Google account. Uh, they and plus like their biometrics, they can restore access to the seed phrase. So basically, the seed phrase is not stored in the open way in iCloud or Google Drive. It's uh, encrypted with your biometrics and, and stored. So basically, if you lose both your I guess uh, pin uh, to the phone and your phone, that's when you actually lose the the key. Um, yeah, but in, in other cases, it saves from kind of like the most common uh, way of losing a seed phrase is when you forgot to back, back it up. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's where we are. It doesn't obviously protect from the leakage of the seed phrase. So if you've written down some seed phrases, that's the biggest concern. So if you write it down somewhere and someone finds it out, finds out your seed money's gone. Um, and obviously, there are ways to prevent from that, but but that requires using a completely different stack. Uh, of custody. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, I think uh, next year would probably be when that gets uh, more and more adoption. Who who are your users? So basically, if you kind of look at financial applications, there are typically kind of users who are kind of happy to use their phones for stuff, but at some point, kind of at some um, level of wellness, this stops, right? You're not going to make yeah. a you know, $1 million transaction from your phone. People just have an aversion to that. So, kind of, who, who, who is your user base? Actually, uh, that's a good question. So, yeah, I have, I have two things on this. So, speaking of the the user base, um, it's uh, it starts with obviously we're not focused on 
a whale type of user. So if you really want to store a lot of money, Ethereum is not the, the right now at least is not the place where you should be doing that. So Ethereum is primarily for your, I would call it like a public on-chain identity. Um, so if you want to mint NFTs, if you want to um, quickly sign into something on on a conference, uh, if you are trying to uh, I don't know like uh, buy some random token or uh, mint a sound. Uh, on sound XYZ or uh, mint a post on mirror. So these types of actions, uh, whether that's collecting or uh, like buying some random tokens in small amounts just to play around, testing new stuff, uh, new dApps, new protocols, games, whatever that is, uh, that's where we we shine really. And uh, Zirin was meant for users who are doing a lot of transactions. So that's kind of opposed to what Ledger is meant to be or maybe safe. Uh, uh, like, I mean, Gnosis is safe, where you keep a lot of funds and you try not to touch them, but when you do, you do it like very carefully. So that would be the use case for a ledger. And that's why like obviously ledger is not convenient. You need, you need to carry it around like plug in, and obviously like you won't, won't do that in like a minute. Uh, yeah. In Zirin, you can just like pull it up, scan up your code or and mint stuff or uh, like test out a new dApp uh, on, on the go. So that's the main use case. Um, and the second thing I wanted to add is, um, I think in the future, it would still work really nicely with these types of use cases. And for that, it's just a little, a bit more time is required. So obviously the safe integration on the Xerian end could, could be one of the solutions where you could like initiate transactions from the phone and there, there's not going to be any security concerns uh, because you would have a second key where, or like you have a, a friend who would need to confirm a transaction. Uh, and uh, even with the ledger, we have uh, some users who are using Xerian mobile experience with the ledger, and soon they'll be able to do that with the extension. So it's kind of like an interface, so you don't have to worry about the key uh, being leaked in any way. Or uh, yeah, you can keep as much funds as you want, obviously, on, on these types of wallets. Uh, so we kind of separate the wallet experience from custody. And currently, our custody works for these like smaller type of uh, like amounts of money, but uh, much broader a set of use cases. Have you looked at kind of second signers and so on that kind of connect with NFC? Because kind of, you know, being mobile first, that's sort of, you know, a low hanging fruit, no? Uh, we did. Um, and by that, you mean like a, kind of like a YubiKey like NFC yeah, something like, to confirm Yeah, exactly. Or like a Tangem card or something. Yes. The issue with all of that, um, so it all sounds great, and I would really love to have something like that. Um, and I've seen, uh, I've tested the numerous like, cards that you need to tap to like confirm transactions. Uh, I even like I have a, an NFC ring uh, <laughs> like here that uh, that I'm using for payment. Uh, so I'm I'm a big nerd for these types of things. But uh, I think when it comes to a more mass adoption, this is uh, logistics. It's expensive. Uh, so basically the if we have this much user base, like only whatever, 10% tops would be willing to pay for it, reveal their address. Like there are uh, like levels and levels of um, considerations that we need to take care, care of before using that specific solution and it never really took off. So I'm, I think our, our way is honestly software rather than hardware when it comes to adoption. So making things cheaper and making them, making them more, um, available through, through existing uh, technology. And that's why, for example, account abstraction to me is is more, um, I guess, a, a reliable way to uh, progress with the UX um, and also like the, the new signature. So if we can use uh, re reuse the signature from um, existing hardware devices, which uh, could basically like that, they're not currently compatible with Ethereum signatures, but if we can make using account abstraction then compatible, then we can leverage existing hardware in the, in the phone and we don't have to even have a ledger. So I think that's the, the best pathway forward and uh, yeah, for, for like all the mass adoption. Cool. So I understand that kind of the users that use Serion currently are kind of like people who go to events who kind of want to try out um, different apps, uh, kind of have spending money just kind of like on, on a um, uh, low barrier to entry mobile app. What are your intended users? Because kind of that's that's um, as as a market, that's a very constrained set of people, right? 
Yeah, um, I think it's constrained right now, but I'm uh, I'm a big proponent of uh, the growth of the Web3 user base. Uh, and we kind of, we, we define our users as Web3 citizens, and we've been pretty vocal about that. Uh, and uh, we, I, I, I still feel pretty strongly that we don't really have to change that. Um, I know that a lot of people are talking about onboarding, you know, the, the newbies, uh, billions of users uh, to to Web3. Uh, but to me, I think it should grow from within. It should grow from uh, the, the Web3 citizens themselves. Uh, and we really want to support the use cases that are uh, actually working and useful in Web3. And that's why we, we want to kind of, we're focusing on what people are doing now uh, in Web3 because uh, um, that kind of gives us early hints of what could be useful for the rest of the market when it, when the time comes. So um, yeah, I don't think, I don't really believe in us kind of deciding, uh, like someone finding out randomly that this is what people would want. And I think the UX of the wallet is, is um, no matter how bad it is, uh, we need to find the use cases within the Web3 space that would attract people. Uh, and once we have that, and I, I hope we won't miss that. So uh, as these narratives uh, w are created within the Web3 ecosystem and Zerian supports them, then all the new users who are going to come to Web3 and become Web3 citizens, they would be uh, the ones, uh, like they would try to look up to all the Web3 citizens who were there and they were uh, coming, they would be coming for the use cases that we've developed. So that that's my point of view. So I'm not like, a, again, a big believer in copying something and just putting on uh, on Web3 uh, and, and making it like look like it's Web2 because, <laughs> because why? Like it's the same, but just more expensive and uh, users would probably come for maybe some incentives, but uh, that, that's it. They would just leave next day. Okay. Um, then maybe looking at the wallet as it is now, not kind of at the user experience as you wanted to develop in the future. What are the challenges of building a wallet? So kind of, I assume there's kind of like, you need to run archival nodes and have like databases and so on for several chains, but walk us through the, the, the details. Well, there's uh, quite a few, and, and that really depends on what kind of wallet we're talking about. Um, so, um, first of all, um, none of the, I guess, like very, very few wallets run archive nodes, just uh, on even nodes. We, uh, even though we do a lot of focus on the data, we don't run our own nodes because this is like someone else's business. They do that better. For us, I think that uh, speaking from like the product perspective, I think the biggest challenge is... Um, really understanding what's key to have on the wallet level versus what's what should live on the DAP level. Uh, and uh, that's an, that's the balance. And I think every every wallet is really going through that. So some some wallets were like, okay, we have to do things very, very certain way. Like this this is the only way you can do stuff. This These are the only DAPs you can access uh, and being very restrictive. There are wallets that are completely uh, kind of removed from uh, from your experience and they just say, okay, that's the key. Uh, everything else is like up to you. I think MetaMask is probably on, on, on that kind of on that spectrum. Uh, so they don't really make any decisions for the user. Uh, they don't try to net like help the user do the, the right decisions at all. I think we sit somewhere in the middle. Uh, so we're being more pragmatic, I would say about it. So we know that spam, for example, is a big problem. So we do work on our end to remove spam because this leads to phishing, it leads to people losing funds. Same goes to um, anything when it comes to like signing off the transaction. We want by default to have protection uh, for, for our users. Uh, so stuff like that is, is where we, we take a stance, um, but we don't want to limit the user. And that's another reason I, I've mentioned that already. We wanted to go with seed phrases because we want users to be able to access a wider range of things. Um, so whatever that they want to access, we want to have that. Yeah, uh, and I think that that's on the product level. From from I guess the the business angle, obviously, is monetization. Uh, we we will talk about that I guess a little later. But um, yeah, monetization is obviously has been a, a pain for most of the wallets, with an exception, I think, of one, <laughs> um, or maybe two. Okay, two. Uh, Ledger, we can count Ledger and MetaMask as like the ones who were not struggling really with monetization. And lastly, I think on the intro side, I don't think it's a it's a really uh, hard thing, um, uh, like a challenge. It's more of hard work that we need to put put into into that. Um, but I hope that pays off. So 
Um, if you think about kind of the decisions you make for the user, so kind of um, what dApps um, to display in your wallet, for instance, what's the approval process? And kind of if I'm a Zerion user, can I make sure that these are kind of audited or trusted or that there's at least so and so much TVL that kind of hasn't been sold? I mean, what, what, are, what are my assurances? Uh, that's a good question. We actually, on the on the DAP list side, we don't do any kind of restrictions. Uh, so you can access, it's more like uh, a Google-like interface. And this is where we're different from, I guess, majority of OS, where, which run like a mini marketplace of the, the approved uh, DAPs. We decided against that for, for the sake of openness. Uh, and uh, basically, we don't really want to recommend any particular DAP. So usually users would come with an intention in mind uh, of what exactly they should do. And uh, we provide that with that. Uh, what we do, though, to help users kind of make slightly, like basically not to go to a different Uniswap, maybe mistype, we have a small blue check mark. Uh, so if they start typing Uni, a few options would show, show up and Uniswap would have the blue check mark. But that's just a list that we maintain of domain name associations. And that's a pretty exhaustive list of non-spammy, non-phishing dApps. Um, yeah, we don't have a process uh, for this one. So it's currently just managed internally. We used to have, um, so for the tokens, we do the same, but the process there is a little different. So we are relying on token lists. So token list is like a decentralized effort uh, for uh, curating legit tokens. So we rely on that. Uh, with dApps, there's no such thing, um, as far as I understand right now. Um, I, we would want to would want to have that if, uh, if that's available. Um, and honestly, we we don't want to make these decisions for the user. Um, that's that's something that we think uh, users should be, should be on their own uh, when making stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How how do you think about kind of the attack attack vectors that kind of come with being a front end to kind of other people's smart contracts, right? So basically, if your front end were to be hacked, um, kind of uh, your users could be kind of uh, siphoned off by malicious sites and so on. So what what kind of security do you have in place for that? Yeah, this is, uh, I think, a very, um, this is somewhat of a more solved problem uh, in a way. So that's not novel. It's uh, something that every, um, every startup is running into that runs any kind of uh, front end. Uh, so I think it's, first of all, it's a little, uh, yeah, it's a smaller problem. And then that just takes um, good uh, hygiene in terms of cybersecurity. Um, yeah, and we, we just do testing of our own infrastructure. We've employed white hackers to poke around and like try to find stuff. The attack vector is still fairly limited um, because it's, Basically, we only need to safeguard um, the deployment of this new up, like the, the new versions of the front end. Uh, and the biggest risk, obviously, is uh, where the keys are stored. So deployment of extension, deployment of uh, mobile apps. Uh, and that uh, a big portion of that security is on the Apple and Google side. So they help you not to make like, basically, if there's a deployment happening, we would all see that. Uh, and it's a, it's a fairly removed risk. Uh, I think for us, where we did pay out bounties, for example, were, um, you can call them like informational attacks. Uh, so I still remember like one big case where we had to pay, it was like $40,000 or something uh, were lost. And that was because uh, someone uh, created a fake balancer pool uh, that looked like a regular balancer pool and had a, and they faked that pool to look like it has a lot of TVL. So it showed up in, in Zerian and people were like, okay, this this is like a legit, they thought it's a legit pool because it has a certain amount of TBL. Uh, and uh, we didn't check the, the factory contract that was created, creating that. Since then, we've started doing that, but that was a bug that we didn't um, anticipate. So it, it was put up uh, on the front page with like high TBL. Someone uh, put some money in it, lost it. So uh, we, we assume that this is our mistake, even though obviously like it's, you have to verify everything, but... Uh, we yeah we didn't mean to show this pool anyway so um, yeah that's uh, these are some learnings uh, we didn't go through like a massive uh, breach of security um, and uh, for us I think like not sending a seed phrase somewhere where where it shouldn't be that would be the, the only thing we should worry about uh, really and for that we just always do the, the audits 
I think it's been, yeah, like six, seven uh, already. And we, we keep doing that. That's going to be a big expense. Another attack vector is kind of having uh, transactions you can't read, right? So basically human readable transaction code rather than kind of like the ABI that you kind of get. Uh, how how do you feel about that? Because it's a, it's a difficult problem to solve kind of generally. But if you don't know what you're signing as a user, it's really difficult, right? Yeah. So for that, I think what really works, I would say, well, is the, the simulations. Uh, so that's been getting implemented across the board. So I think it started with a few extra extensions that or uh, that you need to run in parallel with like whatever MetaMask. Um, but now it's integrated in Xerian, obviously, in the Coinbase wallet and safe. So I think that saves you and kind of allows you to do a quick check uh, of what is actually happening. It's still not perfect because sometimes the dApps would be asking you some signature that is uh, you have you don't have any idea what can, what can happen. You have to have a more yeah, I guess like a secure setup so you understand where this signature can be applied. But I think this is going to be solved over time as well. So uh, we do for uh, specific signatures when when you are issuing a permit for some contract to spend your your USDC or some something else, we would also recognize that and, and show you uh, in the, in a human readable way that some DAP is trying to you know spend this much money. Is it something that you really want to be doing or or not? Um, and yeah, simulation, I think, really, really helps. So if you were in, your intention was to mint an NFT, if this is what you see as a result of simulation, then most likely that's that's correct. Uh, I think in the future, this is even uh, kind of better than in um, in the Web2 world. So in Web2 world, you just uh, plug in your credit card and you, you leverage the trust network of all the POS connected to Visa and they do like all this uh, fraud prevention if they see something iffy, but you, you have to rely on someone else doing the job of verifying that you're actually doing uh, something legit and not every uh, every transaction supports like 3D security with cards. So uh, in, in crypto, you can have basically deterministic outcome of the transaction in, in most cases. So you could see exactly what's happening. I think the security, when it when it comes to signing, will just keep getting better, and users won't even need to know what like ABI is. Uh, and I I really hope that they don't. Uh, at this <laughs> Absolutely. Moment. So I think if we can't make that happen, this is going to remain very niche. Um. So what networks are most of your users on? Uh, good question. It's been changing, um, honestly, and. Uh, We've been very positively surprised how the adoption of layer twos is uh, growing. Uh, so we had uh, like during this year, it went from uh, roughly like seventy percent Ethereum domination to now Ethereum being. Uh, I don't. I don't want to be like. I, I cannot give specific numbers. I didn't re rehearse them. <laughs> but uh, we have. Uh, it's it's one of the chains. So you can uh, you can see it's. It's full list of transactions that are made, be, being done on all different chains, and they roughly similar. I think the biggest one is still Polygon, but it's kind of shrinking in comparison to um, zk sync, for example, transactions or base transactions. Um, Optimism, Arbitrum were historically growing pretty much every month, uh, and Ethereum is kind of like at capacity, so it's it just sits there, and everything else is growing. So it's very exciting to see, uh, and we do believe really like we kind of refocused uh, our attention from DeFi protocols uh, more towards supporting more and more chains because we think that in terms of the primitives we're pretty much there because like I think originally people were thinking that DeFi would create you know thousands and we were one of the you know uh, believers in that that like that we're gonna see uh, at least hundreds of different uh, I mean meaningfully different protocols um, in DeFi or just outside of DeFi, but it turned out I think that we have a pretty stable set of uh, primitives that people use, uh, and everything else is more like uh, yeah forks or just slight adjustments uh, of what we have. Uh, and we've decided that okay, we we have to support this set of uh, primitives, but really where we should uh, spending our, spend our time is uh, you know the number of tokens and and chains that are being created. Uh, because this is because we had kind of solidified the the architecture, I would say, 
uh, of this world computer. So we have all the all the bits and pieces in place, roughly. Uh, these computers can now talk to each other. So now we just need to support this network of computers uh, as as the wallet. How do users go between different chains or d between Ethereum and an L2? Um, do you guys ha kind of have endorsed bridges that you kind of offer as a standard interface or how would I go about it? Yeah, we, uh, we actually support uh, socket.tech. Uh, so we've integrated them and they are an aggregator of bridges. Um, the way it works is just they find the best rates across different um, bridges for any kind of swap. And um, the users just go and like select the bridge they, they want to use so they could optimize for faster transaction, uh, for faster settlement or just cheaper, basically like uh, matching how much they would get on the other side of the bridge. I would say this experience is suboptimal. Yeah, we've been even calculating the number of steps it takes uh, to bridge to like a new chain. So uh, switching to a new chain is very simple. It's just like a few taps. But uh, if you want to move money, you need to go and do probably 15 different steps uh, as far as I remember. Uh, and it also requires a lot of waiting time and it's not transparent. Even in Zerian, uh, we, we do <laughs> as much as we can in terms of tracking assets, but the bridging experience is not optimal because you kind of have this moment where money is gone. Uh, you have it in banks all the time, but uh, in crypto is, is unusual when you don't understand what is happening with the money because it kind of it went away and you just like wait there and hope that it's going to come on the other side. Um, so we, we really want to optimize that in the future. And th the way to do that would be um, basically, and that's a general principle, uh, moving away from multi-chain to one chain UX, as we started describing it inside Zerian. So uh, when users don't really need to understand the differences between chains, unless they want to, uh, and you can seamlessly move and transact uh, on any DAP on any chain without really uh, like going through bridging first and then doing a transaction. So kind of bundling the these two things together, inciting them all at once. Uh, so that, I think that's the the future, and we I don't know when, but, we, but we're definitely going to get there. What what are the steps kind of necessary to get there? kind of the seamless bridging that kind of just goes on behind the scenes without the user even realizing? It's a good question. I think it's, first, it's obviously some UX work that we have to do. Um, and uh, we need to have more universal, I guess, adoption of um, signing, either signing multiple actions on with one tap. Uh, so that's, some wallets already started doing that. Before, the convention was that you have to sign everything, like, every transaction one by one. Uh, but uh, with approvals, that kills the experience because you have to sign multiple things. Um, permits are not universally accepted, so that's uh, that's an issue. Uh, and uh, ideally, yeah, so, so we can bundle a few transactions together um, and uh, bridges are fast uh, and they could execute on the other side. Yeah, I think these are the necessary steps. Um, I don't know what would be... Uh, the guarantees between moving the, uh, bit for bridges to, to work between different kinds of and different uh, versions of rollups. So whether it's going to be the same uh, security guarantees to move from like an optimistic one to the ZK one, um, I'm not too sure about that. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think that would be what we would want ultimately uh, as the goal. So basically, um, you also cover some chains that are not Ethereum L2s, right? This was, you can call it an experiment. Uh, we've, <laughs> uh, we've added support for tracking uh, Solana addresses, um, but that, we all know the FTX story, uh, but really it was, uh, I, I think we, we are not, like our users don't really, uh, they're not Solana users, uh, in short. Uh, and to be quite honest, uh, I'm, we have one of the zero values is, is is don't be a maxi, <laughs> um, and that's just like a you know like whole company value. And we wanted to explore other things. We wanted to to see. So Solano was obviously getting a lot of traction, so we wanted to support it, uh, and we did. Um, since the the FTX and just overall, we didn't see a lot of traction in it, and we haven't really put any more resources. Um, personally. I'm a big EVM supporter and believer uh, because I feel that 
we're kind of past uh, the threshold where it's e e e easy to compete with EVM just simply because we have so much code written down and so much investment done in security. Um, I think we will never, maybe like someday a new Apple will be born that is going to use a bit of a different architecture. Uh, but I don't think that's uh, anytime soon. Uh, it's going to take years, uh, I would say. Um, so EVM is the way to go. And we've been basically the whole infrastructure that we've built uh, for tracking assets, tracking positions uh, is built on EVM and like specifically for EVM. We touched upon it earlier just a little bit. How do you think about account abstraction in MPC? Right. This is a this is a long debate. <laughs> uh, we've been researching both uh, for a long time. I think it started obviously more with MPC and account abstraction became a more recent theme. I think MPC is a little... Um, so there, there are many things I can say, I guess, uh, on, on this. Uh, and the short answer, it depends uh, what we're trying to build towards. When it comes to... Um, experiences that remove the basically the wallet from the picture completely. Uh, so like applications that kind of integrate the wallet inside, I think for them, MPC is the only way right now uh, to manage that. I think in the future though, MPC has much less flexibility than account abstraction for anything related to user experience, like recoveries of phrases, making actions on behalf of the user. Um, so with MPC, I think there are a few attempts how you can implement the same programmability, really, of MPC. Uh, but this is uh, a little too complicated. Uh, and uh, it's hard to see like how that's going to necessarily get all the traction. So it feels like, um, to me, uh, when it comes down... Now, now we can talk about account abstraction. So with account abstraction, I think in the current form, there are still problems. So we started a long time ago with uh, this idea of let's replace all the existing accounts uh, and with, with smart contracts on the protocol level. And I think it was like uh, EIP 2000 something. I don't remember exactly. But that uh, EAP was uh, not a priority for the community and for the protocol developers. So it kind of was buried. And now every everyone is talking about the ERC 437, which is... Uh, making account abstraction kind of on, on the application level uh, and without necessarily being hard for it. So I don't think this is a way to go for Ethereum at least, uh, because uh, be primarily because of the costs associated with that. Um, and I think the, the future of account abstraction is really on L2s, where L2s make this hard choice and basically implement it on, on the level of the protocol when we actually remove the need for uh, users to upgrade and move their assets from you know private keys to account abstraction, abstracted wallets. So I think that's the way to go. Um, and uh, I know that there are some teams that are working on, uh, for example, Gelato uh, team, they're doing a roll-up as a service. So they are thinking about implementing that for all their potential uh, launch partners. Uh, such that this becomes a more of a standard in the space where every account is indeed an account abstracted wallet. Um, and in terms of possibilities, I think what, what would be ideal in terms of the UX is, uh, as I mentioned previously, when we support the same cryptography on account abstracted wallets, together with account abstracted wallets being on the protocol level, I think that's where we get um, all the flexibility that is needed. Uh, and it's not going to be associated with an increased cost uh, for every transaction. And we don't have to do this massive migration. Uh, I don't know what Ethereum is going to do, though. It's tough. I think majority of value is, is already on account uh, on, on smart uh, contracts, which is fine. Probably no one will just use Ethereum with private keys anymore at some point. And with Ethereum will be just for uh, roll-up uh, transactions and, and block confirmations. Um, but we'll see. Um, yeah, I think that's that's our current view on, on the whole thing. We are exploring more native support for account abstracted wallets in Syrian without necessarily launching our own version of it. We kind of see it as uh, in a current form, it would, it would look like a Syrian vault in some way because you still need to have a private key stored somewhere. Um, and that would be the first step. And we actually already enabled um, some of the standards for account abstraction for tracking. So you could 
uh, plug in if you have an account uh, you can plug in and get at least a portfolio value over time for these wallets um we haven't done on uh, haven't done transacting with these wallets yet but we are planning to do that yeah, let's leave that there for now. Um, I, I think there's something I want to come back to later, but um, let's talk about kind of the business models for, for wallets first. So kind of monetizing a wallet has been notoriously difficult in this ecosystem um, with um, the two notable exceptions that you kind of, you mentioned earlier, Ledger and Metamask. What kind of business models exists and why is it so hard for wallets to kind of monetize? Uh, it's a really good question. Um... So we've researched them all, I would say, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> uh, at least like everything that's available uh, on the market right now. Uh, I think there are a few things that really work, uh, but they require scale and they require a bit of a, you know, if, if there is speculation and market movement, obviously trading fees work. And uh, that's been working for MetaMask. It kind of does still because they have a massive user base. They're obviously earning a lot less uh, with, uh, with the bear market, um, but all, all sorts of fees, they work uh, because users are ready to pay for convenience and trust. So as they develop trust um, to your product, if they store enough money in it and uh, they kind of been using it forever, they're okay with paying fees. We took a bit of a different um, pathway here in comparison to like some other wallets. So most of the wallets, they don't have um, any option for more advanced users to stop paying fees. And uh, we took it uh, one step further. So we allow, allow you to basically hold a certain specific NFT. Uh, so zero in DNA with premium uh, that allows you to not pay any kinds of fees. And uh, uh, that's basically our, we wanted to be using Azeria Swap ourselves internally as a team. And for the majority, but like actually big chart of our users who are pretty active and uh, they do a lot of transacting, it makes sense to have the same good experience, but not pay um, you know very high fees uh, for for swaps. But at the same time, this works for uh, less experienced users who are okay with paying fees for the sake of convenience and trust. Uh, so that's uh, the one model that works, and um, yeah. But I'm not really excited about it, and the reason is that uh, tra training fees um, and all kinds of like bridging fees or stuff like that is all driving the wallets towards the financial use cases. And we see less and less transactions uh, specifically for token trades uh, or stuff like that. Uh, so a lot more activities on minting or on doing some governance. So people are doing more things with their wallets rather than just trading. Uh, and I think that drives away the value of this business model. So we don't want to be like Robinhood, end up like Robinhood selling options to retail users just to boost the volumes. For, so for us, like another big thing was um, API. This is something that is not accessible for majority of other wallets because they are just a front end. We provide the data for the uh, wallets and uh, we we support quite a few wallets out there. For example, Rainbow is one of our clients since 2020. Uh, they've been relying on Xerian's data and they're ready to pay for that data because this is powering the user experience and we have more and more wallets who are using and leveraging our data. So that became, uh, you can call it like a bear market uh, rescue <laughs> uh, in terms of revenue uh, and monetization for us. Um, and lastly, I think the way to go, honestly, a long-term vision is to uh, ideally own the whole stack. So moving to um, monetizing pretty much any transactions that user, any transaction that user does. And uh, the way to do that is um, either the applications or the chains share revenue with wallets, or we primarily work with our own chains or layer twos, and we direct users to layer twos that we can monetize. So for example, like launching our own layer two would be an example where we can monetize any transaction with like sequencer fees. Uh, so that's, uh, I guess, the, the path forward potentially but it's a little too early um, and we haven't seen. So this is like very experimental. Uh, there are no wallets currently who have their own layer twos. Um, Metamask is kind of with Lydia is kind of moving in that direction. I think that's what consensus wants at least. Uh, that's the feeling that I'm getting. But um, this might be an interesting avenue. Have you looked at kind of 
becoming even more of a service provider and kind of abstracting fees away from people and kind of having them pay like a flat fee or um, like a service fee that kind of because kind of what account abstraction also in principle enables is kind of abstracting the gas away from the user, which I think mm -hmm. kind of if this kind of if this were to become more mainstream, this is I think where we have to go because I mean, this is kind of the Web2 experience. No one would ever say, you're browsing to my website, please cover your part of the AWS bill sort of thing. So do, do you think kind of abstracting that away and then having people pay for the package, do, do you see that as viable? Uh, we've researched that. Um, I think, uh, first of all, from the UX perspective, you're completely right. This is definitely uh, how it, it will work. Uh, so we'll abstract away the fees, and I think we're not too far off from that. Um, I think when it comes to monetizing that, it's a little different. Uh, so what you're suggesting is that we add a certain um, amount of like margin on top, so we make users pay more uh, for the convenience. And uh, Or you just charge them a flat fee per month, right? So basically kind right. of like, yeah, kind of like you do for kind of a uh, a regular... Uh, bank account kind of you have like five euros per month kind of in fees and but then you don't have to pay for like every transaction right yeah um but even with banks right like most of the banks now provide this service for free so it, it's kind of like a race to bought up to to zero with these types of fees so you, you would ideally want to charge users for the added value and not for just maintaining um you know the Ethereum <laughs> for like running Ethereum if they're not transacting and like basically covering our node and node costs. So most of the services on Web2, you would pay premium only for the features that you really want and not just like them running the AWS. Sure. Uh, so I think the analogy here is similar. So um, we are we are moving, we are releasing this premium kind of in a more um, finalized state this uh, yeah next month as well. Uh, so that would be We'll see basically what our users are uh, interested in paying for. Like if, if we provide them with premium, um, can we provide them a few transactions a month for free? Uh, but these are all more of the economics questions and, and we need to test how it really works. Yeah, I'm, I'm more excited of like basically if we, if we have the chain, so users are interested in paying for transactions, right? So that's pretty much universal. And currently, all of that revenue goes towards the chains themselves, and none of that goes to wallets. And this is a problem. So that I think that um, value distribution have to switch. So either chains start sharing more with the originators of transactions, um, or uh, yeah, chain or wallets become kind of like more uh, vertically integrated with uh, their own chains. Uh, I think that would be th that's my <laughs> uh, prediction. For, for the future, because this revenue stream exists. The users are willing to pay a lot of money for fees, for settlement. Yeah, absolutely. I take it it's not on the near-term roadmap, but kind of where would you see that in terms of like future developments for Zerion? I don't think it's like, so we are very agile still as the, as the startup. Uh, so first of all, you never know. I think that that's the short answer. We, we are convening with... Uh, basically a, a portion of our team uh, later in October to talk about what we should be focusing on really in 2024 um, as the big priority. So for 2023, the, the goal was to build the wallets, so the best wallet for Web3 citizens. And we are almost complete with that. So with the extension release, that would be basically what we wanted to achieve. Um, and yeah, the next uh, phase is uh, a little up in the year. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we can talk about that probably early next year. Okay, cool. And what else are you excited about in the ecosystem? There are quite a lot of things, actually. But um, honestly, this whole app chain movement is what I'm um, really, really interested in. Um, it's not that like we haven't known that already, but uh, with, um, I think we're getting, we're, um, opening up an avenue with like, with scalability, we're opening up an avenue for more um, types of applications that are feasible. So I think DeFi was only possible because like uh, only DeFi was possible because uh, block space was extremely expensive. So 
only financial applications that run uh, for whales would, would work. Um, but now we can see, for example, with uh, Friends Tech or like even Lens a, a little earlier this year, uh, that people are excited about social use cases. Uh, for example, with all the publishing with Mirror or Sound XYZ, where artists can directly connect with fans. Uh, these are the use cases that are very new and only were possible because of the Layer 2 adoption um, and kind of acceptance of Layer 2 as also a feasible avenue for, for settlement. And I'm, I'm excited to see more stuff that is very much Web3 native that is built using the capabilities of more scalable networks. Uh, that's uh, that would be the, like the short answer. Fantastic. So, where will uh, users learn whether their on chain will be launched? Uh, where 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 can they follow you? Is it on Twitter or do you have a Discord? We've been around for a long time. We have actually over a hundred thousand people in, in on our Discord. Uh, so, yeah, whatever your preference is, Twitter. You can type in Zerian or Discord as well. Um, I think the ideal way is just to go ahead and try our, our wallet. If you are still using MetaMask, uh, go ahead yeah. and switch. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, people being super happy about it. If you want to provide feedback, uh, you can ping me anywhere on Twitter, for example, and I'll add you to the beta testers group so you can uh, shape the future of Zerian together with us. Perfect. Thank you, Evgeny, for joining us today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.